Welcome in. Today we're going to talk about neural networks, the statistical mechanics underlying neural networks, that would be the energy functions that underlie all the important neural networks today, artificial general intelligence, and a little bit new, a little bit different for today's conversation, we're going to talk about neuronal group behaviors, neuronal group dynamics, things like neuronal avalanches, and interactions between neurons that are a little bit more interesting or perhaps complex than what we've typically addressed within the neural network research modeling community. So I'm going to ask your indulgence. We're going to illustrate this whole concept of neuronal group behaviors and specifically neuronal message passing with a banana story. Okay, I live in Hawaii. That's the background for this. A while ago, there was a banana tree one of several, in a neighbor's across the fence in the backyard plot. And that banana tree grew to height, and as banana trees will, it drooped over and deposited this beautiful, fine, long stalk of bananas in the backyard where I live. Now, this was a big, heavy stalk of bananas. I think that weighed like you know, 50 pounds, at least 40. Something that was a little bit more that I could easily just put on my back and haul on over. So I managed to haul, drag the thing actually up to the lanai. Big mistake. Do you know that banana sap is the gooeyest, tarriest substance in the world? I swear. A neighbor recommended Gooby Gone. Didn't work. We're talking multiple applications of classic high school chemistry, kitchen chemistry acid-based reactions. That is baking soda and vinegar many, many times to get that goop off the lanai. Never again. Okay. <laughs> but bananas, haul them here. And I sort of deconstructed that long stalk with big, big fat clumps of bananas. And I put those clumps into paper bags and took them around. I made sure, I had to look this up on, on Google Maps, I made sure that I took a big fat clump of bananas to the neighbor who was actually to sort of graph it out a it was a nearest neighbor across the fence but the way the geography of these little plots is laid out I'd never met them and I still don't know who they are and it took some two nearest neighbors across the road in other directions and two next nearest neighbors on either side which turned out to be the physically closest people and I gave everybody you know, bagfuls of bananas. Well, that was wonderful. And a few neighbors traced me down and said, oh, thank you, that was lovely. So last week, a neighbor, I don't know who, it wasn't the nearest, <laughs> it wasn't the next nearest neighbor on that side, so it might be the next nearest neighbor on this side, and I'm going to go knock on their door relatively soon. Um, but I found this mystery bag of fruit on the front porch, the lanai. And it had, guess what? bananas and even more I know you won't be surprised when I show you this bananas bananas grow year-round here in Hawaii so you know this banana sharing thing is uh, <laughs> it's not limited to the Christmas season but also in that because we have our trees and the trees do what they do when they do it so avocados now these are all a week old. Everything was sort of green when I got it, and I, I need to like, tonight, tomorrow is a great big fruit processing day. Not my nearest neighbor, but my next nearest neighbor, that direction, a while ago gave me this beautiful little, I'll pull it up so you can see it here, white pineapple. Oh God, these are so gorgeous. They are so sweet. Tremendously expensive. You, you can't even find them in most grocery stores. They're kind of an exotica got on this property one orange tree and one tangelo tree and they're not in season yet you know that it's Christmas and when all the citrus fruits come into season and they aren't in season yet they're getting so so close and they're starting to drop fruits just by the onesies twosies so this is an orange it's kind of funky looking another orange another orange oh it's gorgeous but this might be a tangelo. And these really odd, funky-looking things that are slightly pear-shaped. There we go, in front of the camera. And sometimes have this kind of warty top. Those are tangelos. God, they are fabulous. They juice so beautifully well. The easiest thing to share them with the people that are closest at hand. 
And when there's a super abundance of fruits, we, you know, everybody who comes to the door, frankly, gets a, a bag of oranges to take home, starting within, oh, probably the next two weeks, I'm just checking out that tree. Whether I know them well or not, somebody could come, like, doing a, a grocery delivery, and hey, here's some oranges to take home for the family. Nearest neighbors, next nearest neighbors first. Now, I don't really know my neighbors that are one step beyond, so they're not going to be the people that I do a message passing with. But if I get a personal connection at all with somebody, all they have to do is show up on the, at the doorstep, then I'm doing a message passing. So let's take this over to what we have right now in neural networks. Right now, a really, really simple system where every neuron, every computational node, it takes inputs from an input layer, you know, all the nodes in the input layer, or all the, if it's up another, all the nodes in the preceding like latent variable layer. And it sums them, weighted sum, puts them to, through a transfer function of some sort. We're starting to get a little wind. Okay, so it burps out its activation mediated by connection weights to a bunch of other nodes. No crosstalk at the same level. It just doesn't happen. That got X'd out of the whole approach back when we went from the Boltzmann machine to the restricted Boltzmann machine. That's 1986 time frame. Even though if you go to the hop field, that's all about crosstalk. So the Bolton machine was all kinds of cross crosstalk. I'm not saying that we made a mistake back then. We didn't. But we definitely went in a certain direction. And the decisions that we made early, early, early in our game precluded other possibilities from our thinking. That's just how things evolved. Now here's the important thing. This is the crux of today's entire conversation. It's not just that we eliminated that neuronal crosstalk. It's that the neuron on which we based our models was a really, really simple model. We were basing it on the McCulloch-Pitts neuronal model and then the Rosenblatt notion of a perceptron. The entire last 50 years, based on the McCulloch-Pitts neural model, means that we've, we've got a provenance that goes back about 70-odd years. And it's a really simple story. So we've pretty much worked this vein of ore to death. Now everybody's talking about generative. Generative is just, look, it's simple. Generative is energy-based system, Bayesian. The whole transformer thing is some fancy things involving the, frankly, it's just the enthalpy term in the free energy equation. And we've about maxed all of this out. I mean, they will make more applications, but really aren't we just over transformers, really? So. The next thing, let's go back and take a look at what other things in the neural, and we're talking about the brain type neural networks that might be interesting. And that's where it gets really interesting because there are things that are useful to us as we consider a new era of neural networks, a new kind of neural modeling that may indeed take us further on that path towards AGI. And that is this. The interesting neural behaviors are not just get one neuron excited, have it burp out a signal to a group of others. No, 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 no. It's dynamics of groups. In particular, groups of neurons become activated at once. And here's the interesting part. These neuronal avalanches have a power law distribution. What that power law distribution means is most of the time you get small groups of neurons active for short periods of time. Very infrequently, compared to that, you get large groups of neurons active for longer periods of time. Power law. It all sort of degrades smoothly in terms of the size of the clusters of neurons and the length of time that they're active. It's a group behavior. Isn't that interesting? Let's quickly take a look at how this applies to corticons, or content-retentive, temporally connected neural networks. We'll specifically look at the latent layer. The internals of this neural network are neurons that become active in a grid pattern and you can excite groups of neurons, that is you can excite clusters and that all depends on just two parameters. Our two parameters are epsilon zero and epsilon one. Epsilon zero controls the fraction of active nodes and epsilon one controls the clustering. 
For our immediate work, we're keeping Epsilon 0 set to 0. This allows us to easily compare our results against an analytic solution, possible only when you've got equal numbers of on and off nodes. Our focus then is on Epsilon 1, governing clustering behavior. It governs the like-near-like association. So as you increase that Epsilon 1, you get more agglutination, more clustering of like together, and wow, that's a clustering thing. So just by playing in this two-dimensional space, and we can start off just in a one-dimensional space, you can just modify that one parameter and go from a random distribution of like-near-likeness to, oh wow, we're causing clusters to come together, which is a reasonable precursor, giving us a substrate for playing with a model of Let's do something that involves a neural dynamics base that gives us group behaviors. That's new, that's different, that's interesting. So moving on, let's touch on a few of the highlights in the evolution of this notion of neuronal group dynamics. If you've been with me for a while, you've undoubtedly seen this slide before. We're talking about the evolution of energy-based neural networks, that is the Boltzmann machine, typically, which derived from the Hopfield neural network, rapidly became the restricted Boltzmann machine. Then, of course, Hinton evolved the contrast of divergence mechanism in 2002, and from there his students went on to develop the first deep learning methods. So that's of course characterized the last several years of neural networks, and it's been the most dominant theme that we know of. You see Paul Werbis up at the top. Werbis invented the backpropagation method in 1974 as part of his doctoral dissertation, and this was the same year in which William Little published work on what became the progenitor for the Hopfield neural network, which is better known as the Little Hopfield network. So both of those major kickoff inventions were 1974, meaning that the entire history of neural networks as we know it today, and that is functional computational neural networks, is about 50 years old. Now let's take a step and look back into time. We're going to put in the McCulloch Pitts and the Rosenblatt inventions. As you can see here, the Kulak and Pitts developed their computational neuron model in 1943. That was the basic SOMA, which was the aggregate computational unit with a transfer function, and then it shot out its result through an axon, and then that got distributed to other neurons. Now, Frank Rosenblatt picked up on that in 1957 and created the first known model of a perceptron or a computational system composed of these basic neurons. So we can see that the forerunners for the kinds of neural networks that we have today all began with notions of single neurons acting with other single neurons in a somewhat coordinated manner, but there was essentially a focus on the activity of individual neurons and not a collective dynamic. Before we progress to these neuronal dynamics, let's take a quick segue and take a look at activation decay within individual neurons. As we already know in our studies of perceptrons and energy-based neural networks, unless we're considering something like a recurrent neural network in any of its forms, and that includes long short-term memories, the neural networks don't maintain their activation from one instance to another. That is, if we stop giving it an activation stimulus, the neuron doesn't have an activation. And that means that it really doesn't have memory persistence over time. I've used the notion of sausage making in describing the kinds of neural networks that are most dominant and that are shown in the perceptron and energy-based neural networks. The idea of neuronal activation decay has been studied since relatively early. Koch and Sega have edited a beautiful volume in 1998 summarizing work on neurons and neural groups up to that point, and they did a lovely review in 2000. We can jump ahead to work by Funahashi and Nakamura on continuous time recurrent neural networks. That's in the 92 and 93 time frame, and they introduced a simple exponential decay for the neuron. In 2020, of course, Hassani and colleagues developed the liquid time constant networks, or LTNs, which involved a much more complex differential function characterizing the soma, or the internal body, of each LTN neuron. Having a smooth function for activation decay is also important for cortical in fact, they were important back in the 1992 
1993 original architectures. Now before we go on to group properties again, let's take a moment and note the important role of feedback loops in brain processes. Most neural networks people think of feedback as something that we do during neural networks training, for example in the back propagation training mechanism. However, feedback has a tremendously important role in active neurophysiological processes. Some of the most important work here has been done by Gerald Edelman, who is a Nobel Prize winner, and he is most famous for notions such as group neuronal selection. This notion of group neuronal selection, which Edelman has also described as neural Darwinism, is his way of describing how nervous systems in an organism perform natural selection for categorizing the things in the world that it unifies in terms of perception, action, and learning. This is an important element of Edelman's work, but also the notion of re-entrant signal processing is very compelling if we're going to be developing AGI. Re-entrant signals are a means by which after you activate one neuronal area, it then sends signals back to the original area that provided the activation as well as others. Now re-entrant signal processing isn't how we do our nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor neural interconnections. Rather, it's a long-range means of connecting different neural groups, such as cortical domains. As Edelman expressed it in a paper that he wrote just a year before his death, it was co-written with Joseph Galli in 2013, neurons belonging to different cortical areas are also reciprocally interconnected by re-entrant networks of excitatory neurons. Now, Edelman first published his ideas on re-entrant signal processing in 1978 in a book that was co-written with Vernon Mountcastle. It's called The Mindful Brain, and they each had a very large section in it, each of which was devoted to one of their own works. Just as a personal story, I found this book when I was really young, uh, high school possibly, certainly no later than college years, and I was browsing the stacks and came across this book relatively shortly after its publication. It wasn't that old. I found this book and I was so excited. I took it home and I could really only read a few pages at a time because I would just get, ooh, this is so wonderful about the content. It inspired me. I can't say that it shifted the course of my life because I was already leaning in that direction. I was looking, for example, for books just like this when I was browsing the stacks. But this one truly confirmed and enhanced and totally gave me that deeper sense of motivation and fascination with how we could actually model the brain. So I went back to work doing math, physics, and chemistry to develop the tools. As I mentioned, the book itself was published in 1978, reprinted by MIT Press in a soft cover in 1982. And if you don't feel like getting the whole book, Edelman wrote an article together with Joseph Galley shortly before his death. It was 2013, and he died in 2014. Good brief summary right there. Also, you might want to notice in the blog post associated with this YouTube, I've got a lot of references. All the article references are to ones where there's a online access. There's nothing that's locked away. Olaf Sporns, who's done some really fabulous experimental and theoretical work in neurophysiology, definitely described the role of Edelman's contributions in his own 2013 paper. I've got that linked in the blog post. So let's sum up what we've got so far in terms of the big themes or important inspirations that we've gathered from neurophysiology. There are two so far. The first is the notion of neuronal activation decay. We've seen this most recently in liquid time constant networks. It's definitely been incorporated as a theme. Now, the other important notion that we've addressed so far has been re-entrant signal processing. And we can ask the question, if this is so important, and if a number of very bright minds, well-funded, totally focused and dedicated to creating AGI, haven't used this, the question is why? Why haven't we brought in the kinds of re-entrant signal processing that would give us a powerful AGI? Well, there's an answer. The answer is this. Re-entrant signal processing, if done right, and it has to be done right as a survival necessity, otherwise it wouldn't work. So re-entrant signal processing done right has to pack a powerful punch. It can't just be a gently whispered, nuanced suggestion. It's got to be firm, forceful, and directive. It's got to be a do this, don't do that. It has to say, put your attention here and ignore this other stuff. In other words, it's got to come down with the force and authority of Moses descending with the Ten Commandments. It simply can't be ignored. But if it's doing all of this, if it's spurring all these neuronal group excitations, 
then what's to keep the system from going totally bonkers? We certainly know about the role of inhibitory neurons. Yes, we do. But we're talking about bringing in powerful stimulus that activates certain other neural groups in resonance with what we're already doing. It's got to be powerful. And because of its power, it has to be mediated and modulated. And the way to do that is that we bring the system somewhat globally into a free energy minimum. Now, of course, I'm not the first to suggest free energy minimization in the brain. Certain researchers come to mind, Walter Freeman, of course, Robert Kausma, they've done beautiful and important early work, and of course, Carl Friston. In fact, I remember it was the 2014 to 2015 time frame. I was just getting back into this research topic after a very prolonged delay. And being a physical chemist with a strong belief in the power and importance of free energy, I googled free energy minimization and brain. And of course, the page was quickly populated with Carl Friston's articles and I looked at his work and said, oh my gosh, I absolutely have to understand what he's doing. And that began what is nearly a decade by now of fangirling on Carl Friston, which he knows. So here we are, the only tool that's powerful enough to give us some control, some mediation over reentrant signal processing is going to be free energy minimization across the lateral suite of cortical assemblies. To do free energy minimization, of course, we need a free energy equation. And the one that's actually most suited for this has been relatively obscure up until now, which is why we haven't seen it in action. But that's the use of the corticon. It uses a free energy equation, the cluster variation method developed by Kikuchi and then advanced by Kikuchi and Brush, which is eminently suitable for our task. Specifically, we can control the number or the fraction of active nodes, as well as the degree of clustering, and that will help us a lot. And by the way, we're recording this live in Hawaii, and it's always a challenge to get a time that isn't quite being overrun with the neighborhood dogs, the construction, chickens, the ever-present chickens. And if you're hearing chickens in the background, well, it's 5.30 in the morning and, and the roosters have been waking up. So before we go on, let's add a third item to our list of neuronal inspirations. This is our hip pocket cheat sheet on important notes for building AGIs. We'll add free energy minimization to our list. So returning to our storyline on neurophysiology and its potential impact on AGI. Back when, way back when, way back when I was originating the whole corticon notion, I was in the Brain Research Center at Radford University. Actually, I was with the math department back then, and I was affiliating with the Brain Research Center. It was founded by the university president as a center that was going to be directed by Carl Prebram, absolutely luminary genius. The guy was so brilliant. I would sit in Carl's lectures and just be blown away with the the possibilities that he was presenting for us. One of them, because this is early in that neural network modeling era, one of them was the notion of more complex dendrodendritic connections. In other words, you get a neuron, soma, that's the axonal body, active, and then it's going to send out a pulse, but it doesn't just go down the axon and then burp things in a specific way to other neurons. There's this fine, complex mix of the dendrites from one neuron coming out and interacting with the dendrites from other neurons. So it's a subtle thing. It's not just a lerp over time. It's more of a building that, that interaction. And here's where it gets interesting. It's mediated by the chemical bath in which they're situated. So there can be more than one kind of interaction, potentially. We're not going to go there right away. For the nearest, nearest foreseeable future, we're going to do some real simple nearest neighbor modeling and next nearest neighbor, and we'll look at the triplets. And by the way, when we take a look at the, at the neural modeling studies, they say next nearest neighbors, nearest neighbors, triplets, that's pretty good for, for getting a handle on modeling the situation. And also, when we go back to the original Kikuchi papers, they're finding, they were saying back then, this is the 1950s, 60s time frame, that you could pretty much model a two-dimensional grid with a simple nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor triplet interaction. Thank God, because that's complicated enough, and, and we'll be looking at those equations more sh- shortly. But, 
But that notion of dendrodendritic, I've got to be careful when I say that, dendrodendritic interactions, the possibility of different kinds of interactions. Well, yeah, send an orange. <laughs> send a star fruit. <laughs> send an avocado. <laughs> there are different things that you can send as an interaction. We're not there yet. We're not going to be for a while, but that is one of the reasons that we're building this next gen of code as object-oriented because we need the flexibility. Well, I got ahead of myself. Let's go back to Professor Carl Prebrum and take a quick look at one of his most notable inventions, and that was something that got referred to as the holographic brain. This kind of notion was advanced. And by the way, Carl did not regard that as his crowning glory. He actually thought it was one of the more minor of the points that he'd made. Uh, but it was simple for people to grab onto that notion and, and explain it to themselves. It was catchy. So that's the one that took hold the most, which is the notion that memory or other kinds of neural activities are distributed across areas of the brain and that they're not localized to just one set of neurons processing a specific memory. So let's note these two new ideas on our AGI building cheat sheet. First, we want the possibility of complex interactions between nodes and groups of nodes, specifically different kinds of message passing. That, of course, is my allusion to the passing around oranges or bananas or star fruit or whatever fruit you have on hand. That's the whole rationale for this story. But also, we can have different kinds of interactions, both locally, nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor, versus long range. And that's definitely possible with the corticon structure. Also, we may consider at some point having multiple ways to store things. That's still very much on the optional list. Now, my own invention of the corticons began when I was affiliated with Carl Prebrum's Brain Research Center at Radford, and it wasn't so much inspired directly by the notion of either holographic memory or even the notion of dendrodendritic communications between neurons. It was more inspired by the overall ambiance or an infusion of the notion that neural interactions could be much richer and more complex. So that led to the first instance of corticons, which was implemented using a very, very simple model, a one-dimensional model at that time. After 1992, I put corticons into hibernation mode while I worked for various corporations and signed over intellectual property rights for the time that I was working. So I didn't pick up on corticons again until about 2014 when I began to retrace all my original work and then start the new line of inquiry. Within that time, though, there was a lot of interesting work that began and has continued forward involving neuronal avalanches. There was important work by Beggs and Plentz in 2003 and also by Pascal Fries in 2005. Since then, there's been a lot of work. It continues to grow and build, and there's interesting things evolving about the nature of communications between different neuronal groups. For example, are they cued to oscillate with each other at the same time or are there different mechanisms involved? So the summary of those works, not a complete detailed review, just some of the most important and interesting things that I found are all in the blog post. Please do check that out. So all this interesting work in neuronal group dynamics, specifically neuronal avalanches, isn't so much the inspiration, but rather a confirmation that modeling patterns of group behavior in a situation where we can control the degree of activation, both the total numbers of nodes that are activated, as well as the size of the various neuronal clusters, that's something that we can do using corticons. And it's one of the most exciting connections between corticons and neurophysiological modeling. More to the point, when we can maintain certain nodes and clusters active, even when their originating stimulus has ceased, and when we can use those persistent activations as a means of generating short and long-term connections to other nodes and clusters, we've got a basis for some very interesting AGI capabilities. One more important note, I believe that we can use corticons as the model itself within variational inference and active inference. So that led to a longer study. I've got a link to the compendium for those references in the blog post associated with this YouTube. So... It's been lovely having a moment with you. Please go to the blog site, check out the references. I'm going to put in all those different neuronal avalanche and neuronal group communications papers that are currently cluttering up my browser windows, and I need to get them you know, down into order anyways. And then we'll progress from there, because the second thing 
to talk about with you very briefly is that what's coming up next is a Christmas present. I'm shooting this in November 23 over these next several weeks and in particular because I promised a colleague I would do this. We're going to come up with an exercise that you can do just for fun. This is a Christmas present. It's going to be the one-dimensional cluster variation method. It's going to be the simplest version of it possible, but it will be code. It'll be parameters that you can change and then see the impact on the free energy. We're getting back to that. And then you'll be able to do some really interesting experiments on your own, easy as can be. We're going to give you a very structured walkthrough so you can play with this to your heart's content over the coming Christmas vacation. Thank you so much. It's been lovely having a moment with you. Once again, Aliana Marin, founder and chief scientist at Themesis, signing off. Have a lovely day.